Welcome to Hack Circus. This is a very different episode because the first half of it, unfortunately, failed to record on my recorder. My recorder actually just crashed and turned itself off, which it's been doing lately, actually. And I lost um, my side of the chat. But I think, in fact, it doesn't matter and you may prefer it without me in it so much. So let me know if you prefer it this way. It's more like a sort of lecture um, from somebody who's talking directly to you. So I think I made it work. (laughs) Let me know what you think. It's um, a philosopher this week, Sean Power. He's based in Ireland and he knows a lot about time and illusion and thinks about the really fascinating, actually, big questions. He's involved in lots of really cool collaborations with artists, which is how I came across him, in fact. And he contributes to Hack Circus, the magazine, too. So have a look at some back issues, um, look him up if you want to find out some of the things that he's been writing for us, often involving thought experiments and sort of semi-fictional scenarios as examples of philosophical conundrums. I hope you enjoy the episode. It's it's all about interesting, deep philosophical stuff and silly science fiction films, if you like that sort of thing. If you are enjoying the episodes, please like and subscribe on iTunes. It really makes a difference and it only takes a second to hit the stars. Uh, We're also on Facebook it's facebook.com stroke hack circus podcast we've got our own podcast page now and twitter at hack circus so follow us there until last friday i worked in university college cork and now I'm starting lecturing in Trinity College, Dublin. I specialise in lecturing in the philosophy of time. That's my area, I guess. Um, and I also work a little bit on the philosophy of consciousness and perception. And I've gotten very interested in the idea or concepts around uh, illusions or other kinds of errors related to perception and so on. Um, so I do that too. So that's where I'm kind of at the moment. But I mainly, I mainly seem to be getting to be known as a philosopher of time more than anything else. Um, like I'm going to be writing the, the, the Routledge textbook on it. Literally, I'll be writing the book on the philosophy of time, um, which I've got to get going on. But I'll be writing that. And I, you know, I went to the Centre for Time at the University of Sydney just last this summer and taught like a bunch of classes and gave a few talks. And it was all about time and consciousness and neuroscience and stuff. So that's what I do. I, I do a lot of interdisciplinary work. Um, sometimes I worry too much, um, although I think interdisciplinary work is really important. It's very important, and I even think it might even be arguably that some people can be um, can be specialists in that at certain stages. Um, I think uh, uh, I think people. Sorry, this is a slight detour, but just to say I think that also it's very good to be really good at your own subject and talk to people from your own subject who will judge you without going politely. Oh, I don't really know your area. They'll go, I know your area, and what you say is total rubbish. Or I think what's wonderful what you say, and it's very life. It's very affirming in terms of your sense of your ability. But I do do a lot of interdisciplinary work. Um, for uh, I'm, I'm part of a research network which was funded by the European Union up until a few years ago. I was like a member of it. Um, it's a huge network called Timely Research Network. Um, headed by a psychologist based out of Greece called Argyro Vatakis. I hope that's how to pronounce her name. I've never actually spoken to Argyro, even though I've had many emails with her. That was a very interdisciplinary project. A lot of neuroscientists and philosophers meeting up, or psychologists and philosophers, and we all talk about time together and time perception. So yeah, I've done a collaborations with people like that. And I did it in Sydney. I, I gave a talk at their psychology department and their history of science department and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I've done collaborations also with artists. But one I've done is with Sinead MacDonald, who's a fur- who I think of as a, a further member of the circus. I did two things with Sinead at two different exhibition spaces she had. She had and she had a solo exhibition in the Driocht, and I did the opening night for her there. But I've actually done a lot more collaborations with an artist called Grace Weir, who's an Irish artist um, who's kind of partially based out of Dublin, partially based out of... Uh, uh, um, uh, um, Grace does a lot of work on photography and memory and time and and she did this um, thing in the Schrodinger Theatre which is the theatre named after Erwin Schrodinger in Trinity College Dublin um, he did this um, series of lectures in the 30s or 40s on life that inspired uh, Crick and Watson um, ideas that helped them think about DNA and so on um, and he did lectures there and it's kind of a 
in memory of that, but also as part of Grace's exhibition, she got myself, she got this physicist, and the three of us went and gave this kind of triplet lecture, you know, a joint talk. And, and the physicist, Shane, um, um, Shane Bergen, he showed like light experiments, you know, really amazing things of colour and, and water and light. And then Grace developed a photograph live in front of people and also showed films about her photography. And I just talked about time. That's what my job was, to stand there and talk about time and memory and everything. And that's how we collaborated. With artists, what happens, we often have a one-to-one meeting and talk about what we're both interested in. And then we see overlaps and we go, oh, that's interesting. Let's talk about that. So, for example, with Grace... The very first time I met Grace, um, we sat and talked for about two hours and during she's having an exhibition and I just kind of turned up at it. And we talked about um, time and photography and memory and so on. But I, she got really interested in this idea that I had about um, it kind of affirming your existence. Nietzsche says, imagine if you had to go through this again and again and again eternally, if time just kept repeating, if history kept repeating over and over and over again. And um, some people take that as an idea that time is a great circle. And as it's a great circle, you go back to the same moment over and over again. And I, as this kind of philosopher of time, get obsessed with the use of metaphor to do time and the way we describe time. And said, kind of argued that actually, if history repeats itself or events repeat themselves, time isn't a great circle. It's much more like a wheel spinning or something. But it's, it, time itself is not a circle. Now, you might go, why is he obsessing over this? It par- partly because you can't really repeat time, if that makes any sense. Like, you can't say the same moment repeats because repetition itself implies a difference. Like, when you say that something repeats, it happens twice. When you say it happens twice, it happens at two different times. You need double times to have repetition. You need multiple times for anything to repeat or occur again and again. So in a strange way, you could never say time itself repeats. I, I used to get very pernickety about this stuff. I don't even... But, but we started working on that idea and then talking about memory and, and the project developed out of that. But I'm just... I'm only mentioning that because it's like a small, almost very abstract idea. But then she started finding it interesting and started playing with it. But actually, generally what happens with projects when I work with people is that... Um, on their side, I, we talk for hours about time, or we talk about Bergson, or we talk about Einstein, because I've, I've worked on those then, um, and then the work and the writings. Um, and then something comes out, and then what happens is the artist comes back to me and goes, I like this bit and this bit and this bit. And then if we start to do something together, they go, will you talk more about this and develop it? And then they tell me what they're doing, and then I modify it and play with, you know, think about how that might be relevant to what they're doing. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it does, you know. If you go back, like, if you went back to me 30 years ago and you said, so I'm a kid, and you said, hey, do you want to be a philosopher when you grow up? I would just look at you, you know, I go, what, what's a philosopher? I mean, I didn't grow up in a country. I mean, I, I don't know if I knew what a philosopher was until I went to college. Um, when I was a kid, you know, there, were, there was religion. You know, I, I, I slightly jokingly say to my friends or to people who aren't Irish that uh, I grew up almost in a theocracy. You know, a very, very religious country. Like, you know, when there's matters of state, a, pre, a, a religious figure would come on the news and talk about it, um, which I can't imagine um, happens in the UK or even then happened. And so questions of like very abstract things, metaphysics, Questions about, you know, what is there after death or what is a self or what is a human being or what are accidents versus essences and what's, what's a substance? You know, if these questions even ever came up, they were dealt with in a religious context. And then there was science and science was science fiction. Science was spaceships, basically. You know, it was Buck Rogers and um, 2000 AD, which I read a lot. Of. Actually, I grew up, my brother grew up in 2000 AD, my older brother. I grew up on um, Eagle Comic. I grew up in I grew up in Dan Dare. So when I was a kid, what did I want to be? I guess I wanted to be some sort of I wanted to be a scientist. I guess, but I wanted to be this kind of scientist on a spaceship looking into the mouth of a black hole. <laughs> you know, that's it. And then I went into physics. Um, but even before I started doing physics as a kid, I found myself questioning things, but I didn't question them the way I think a lot of my friends questioned them. A lot of my friends became atheists and went, yeah, obviously God doesn't exist, obviously there isn't life after death, obviously there isn't any of these things. While with me it was like, well, you know, 
uh, why are the reasons that we don't believe or do believe? What, what's what are the what's going on here? What what? Why do you believe what you believe? And that got me interested in. I got me interested in those questions. Then I went into physics, and I got fascinated by quantum physics and relativity. I went into second year physics, and then just found myself frustrated because it seemed like we were told learn all this maths off, and uh, then do these problem sets. And I am not diminishing that at all. And I think, in fact, I regret. One of my great regrets is not pursuing my physics career that I was trying to start at the stage. But I turned over to philosophy, and philosophy did actually ask questions that I found were important to me. There were questions I thought were important. Um, so that's how I got interested in it. The hard problem of consciousness is the is brought up by David Chalmers, the philosopher David Chalmers, in the early nineties, and Chalmers's argument. Um, was that there are certain ways of thinking about consciousness which are, might be called the easy problems or uh, yeah, easy problems of consciousness and these are the problems of consciousness which are actually not easy problems at all they are very, very, very difficult but they seem to be solvable by using physical worldviews by having a materialist or a physical worldview a view of the mind or consciousness just being a property or being a, a procedure or process in the brain so stuff happens in the brain some of that stuff that happens in the brain is consciousness some of the stuff that happens in the brain isn't consciousness and you've got to ask the question which bits are consciousness and which, which bits are instances of consciousness which bits aren't that's an easy problem arguably you know you can figure out and there's lots of psychological states you know why do people feel fear why is there pain why do we have this they seem like easy problems of course they're actually fascinating problems they're challenging they're difficult have we answered them yet? Maybe they're also hard problems. Maybe they're impossible. You know, these are, that's a different story. The point is, in principle, or at least conceptually, they seem to be solvable using the usual scientific method, using empirical evidence, using theorizing based on science, scientific evidence. That's an easy problem. Um, the hard problem it was that Chalmers observed or claims that there's another aspect of consciousness which isn't like that. It's the feeling of being conscious. It's the feeling of pleasure or pain, the feeling of something being salty or sweet, um, what it's like to see red, you know, what it's like to see the actual readiness of red things, of an apple, what it's like, I guess what it's like, although I don't think anyone uses this example, what it's like to see the squariness of squares, I guess. Anyway, this is um, supposed to be the hard problem of consciousness because it isn't obvious that all this physical stuff that happens that gives rise to our behavior, for example, or the way we react, or even us crying, or saying, hey, you look good today, or anything like that, that doesn't seem to need this sensational aspect, or this raw, these raw feels, or this feeling. You don't seem to need it, you know. Um, you know that episode of Simpsons where uh, Homer Simpson's mother talks about her life in the 60s and burns down a lab belonging to Burns. And the doors burst open while it's on flame and Robbie the Robot comes out on fire and goes, why? Why was I programmed to feel pain? That's the question. Why? Why are we programmed to feel pain? Why are we conscious? You know, and that's a huge question. And not only that, but as, as the philosopher John Searle says, that seems like all the important stuff about consciousness is right there in the hard problem. If there was no hard problem, we probably wouldn't care about consciousness as much. You know, it's like, you know, if there, if there are what some people call philosophical zombies, if we're all philosophical zombies, we wouldn't care about whether we're conscious or not. But we do. We care about pain and feelings and so on. So that problem, I went, read that and went, oh, that does seem to be a philosophical problem. And I got interested in that, went back to college and completely got diverted into the philosophy of time through what I took as my courses and totally changed and brought in all my, my physics training uh, the little physics training I had brought that all into my philosophy and ended up going on about relativistic physics and the structure of consciousness which is one of the first papers I've ever published so that's where I've ended up where I am it's really particular actually to my subject matter I think and so like I guess if this long winded answer to your question why did I, how do you make a philosopher? I guess you make a person who gets obsessed with a particular question and tries to answer it. And then maybe you give them a college degree in philosophy, I guess. But actually, I don't know if the second thing is that necessary. Time is a new subject in the way that we do it now. That's why I think there's actually a case for saying that the philosophy of time, or time as a subject, is a very... 
like it's a 20th century, 21st century question, you know? So it's not thousands of years old. Although I, I, should, say, I should say that there's, there's parallels in some of the questions about time in old philosophical texts from, amongst some skeptics and so on who I'm using. But I think that the stuff you ask about time at the moment are new, and it's because of physics, but it's also because of other um, areas of philosophy too. But I definitely think Einsteinian, like relativistic physics, the thinking required to make sense of that in the world has driven us into thinking about time in a way that we used to think about it. But the other thing is, the idea that those questions have never been answered is what motivated, for example, the philosopher Wittgenstein to think that maybe there aren't actually answers to these problems and we shouldn't be asking these problems. So Wittgenstein famously argued that a lot of things that are thought of as puzzles of, I'm sorry, problems of philosophy are not problems of philosophy. They are puzzles of our language. We don't realize that the way we're, we, we, we're speaking in a certain way and then we kind of get misled by the way we speak. We start playing with the language, you kind of go on a holiday. Language takes a holiday to use Wittgenstein's um, um, famous um, sort of aphorism. Anyway, language takes a holiday. Um, but there aren't actually any philosophical problems. And once we pay attention to how we speak, once we are careful about our language, um, then the problems disappear. And he kind of said, you know, these problems that Plato were obsessed with and people are still obsessed with, clearly asking them for 2,000 years hasn't done anything. They must not be problems that can be solved. You know, that's a mistake, so we should stop thinking we can solve them. Um, so in answer to your, your, your uh, question, um, do I think all, what I'm doing is kind of giving a novel approach to all questions? I guess I don't think I am, because I think my subject is kind of new. But I also, but I also think that um, if I am, I would be doing the kind of problem, thinking about problems that... I'd be a bit wary of myself because I'm, 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 I think, I've, well, I've been accused of being, a, well, not accused, but I've had at least one philosopher tell me, so you're a Wittgensteinian, huh? Um, I'm not really sure in a positive sense. So here's, a, here's a thing that science and maths seems to have going for, seem to have going for it. And if there are any scientists and mathematicians listening to this and you go, uh-uh, nope, then, then fair enough. Um, which is that... Uh, they, they can tell you how to solve, the, to answer the question that they're setting. You know, it becomes a scientific question when somebody goes, here's an experiment we could do. So, you know, is it possible, here's a question, here's a scientific question. Is it possible, here's, here's allegedly, here's a scientific question. Is it possible for us to create a wormhole and then tow a planet to one mouth of the wormhole and to drag, to drag the wormhole around so that it faces the other mouth of the wormhole. Drag one mouth of the wormhole so it faces the other mouth of the wormhole and so that we can create basically a time machine. Can we do that? Now, I can't think of anybody who can do an experiment like that, but at least it seems like there's an experiment you can do where you can answer it because you can do just what I said. Well, it seems like you could do it physically, um, but Kip Thorne, he was approached by Carl Sagan before Carl Sagan wrote Contact. And Carl Sagan said, uh, look, I want you to build me, basically. I know that it's very difficult for us to build a machine that can travel to the stars instantaneously or time travel or all that kind of stuff, but I want you to do it for me. And um, I want you to figure out a physical way it works. So they sat down and figured out a, fi a way of thinking about general relativity a certain solution to certain equations that would allow us to, in, in principle, a physically realizable um, machine that might be arguably a time machine or a machine that allows you to travel very close, you know, fast at the speed of light or travel instantaneously with wormholes and so on. So the thing is, the question, or can we ever, or is there alien, alien life on a distant planet or can we ever travel faster than the speed of light or could, you know, to use Ola Stapleton's book, First and Last Men, or Last and First Men, um, could there be a future race of human beings that are, who are potentially immortal and could live forever? Or could we live forever? Actually, living forever is an interesting one because you kind of, it's a difficult one to prove because you've got to live forever to prove it. You've got to keep on proving it every day. But, you know, could, you, could, could nigh on immortal beings because they jog every day and have a really good modified version of a Fitbit and they, they do all the things that immortalists are trying to do, could they live as longer than the age of the Earth, you know, long enough to see the sun die? Well, that's kind of a thing you could maybe prove. You could run an experiment that could show it by hanging around and, you know, potentially you could show it. Um, 
that big long digression is that that seems to be the sort of stuff that a scientific question might answer there's some experiment you can answer some empirical evidence you can pick up on philosophical questions aren't really the same they, they don't they don't get proved by doing an experiment and showing the answer they're more about sorting out the concepts and, and thinking through someone says I believe the world is like this or I think the world is like this and you kind of test it in different ways um, you see if it's coherent you try to think of possible ways the world could be even though the world couldn't be that way like you could never actually do an experiment even in principle you think about certain ways the world could be to test your concept uh, a friend of mine and I used to have this thing called the. Tw- um, this has nothing to do with AA we used to have a thing called the 12 steps and the 12 steps were where you're walking along and someone says I had a lovely ice cream today and the other person goes yeah that reminds me. Do you know, they don't think that the, the KT event was enough to kill off the dinosaurs. And the first person goes, how does that remind you? And then the two of them have to work it out. They're going to go, what the heck got from A to B? And then you work it out and you build the steps up. And it's almost like Chinese whispers. Or I don't know if there's a, or a telephone. That's what it's called, isn't it? It's almost like telephone. i got to say, sometimes philosophy, a lot of time philosophy, for what it's worth, sometimes philosophy really doesn't want that to happen. Like you don't want... <laughs> You don't want to be creative in that way. You don't want to find out that the why you believe something is because you kind of misunderstood a word three days before, or you've got this free association. That part of the creative process is a lot of fun, but philosophy is supposed to have proofs. And the proofs are actually, a lot of the time, they're, they're essentially syllogisms. I would argue for X, here's an argument that says, if you believe this premise and you believe this premise, you must believe X. And, uh, and then you set out showing that it's valid, which means that if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. And then what you try to do is defend the premises and you try to get people motivated to accept the premises that you've put forward. Um, and you can often get, but you can still do something that seems creative or almost surprising because what happens is people never, often don't put stuff together. So what I mean is sometimes it, gets, it can be interesting because people don't... Because I think sometimes at least, or I think a lot of the time, people don't push things together you know they don't take different concepts from different areas or they don't they just don't push them together or they just take concepts as they're given and assume there's no controversy I have to say the really surprising thing about philosophy for me doing it is the thing that people often accuse philosophers you know get really frustrated with philosophers about which is that you say something like I think all people who murder other people should be locked up and that philosopher goes well and then turns around and starts saying, well, if you think about it, how are you sure? And starts drilling down and, and questioning everything, right? But a lot of the time, the reason why you're questioning everything is because, well, because it's questionable. You know, if someone says, I believe the following, and they say it as if it's, a, it's a universally true, and there could be no exception, no counterexample to it. And I think a lot of philosophers will go, well, actually, here's a counterexample. And they'll play with it. They'll say, okay, so here's a counterexample. Given what you said... This is an example where that's false. And then someone else goes, uh, well, that's a really ridiculous counterexample. But it's still there, which means that you've got to kind of tighten it up. It's, just, it's an invitation to go, well, maybe I don't really mean that or something like that. Uh, maybe I'll look at it a different way. But often what happens is that, that part, that's, part and part, that's part of or another way, another side of taking ideas and seeing what happens when you put them with other ideas and then playing them out or, or, or taking an idea and then unpacking it, going, well, what do you mean by... If you say the cat is on the roof, and you go, what do you mean by a cat? What do you mean by a roof? And it might turn out that there's a, a lion sitting on top of um, your Oldsmobile, you know, and it's actually a terrifying moment. You know, it can, it can be lots of things implied. In the philosophy of time, it's often stated, and possibly argued, but often I've seen it stated more than argued, that... There is this intuitive view of time, and that intuitive view of time is called presentism. Presentism is a view that the only that all, everything that is real is in the present moment, in this moment, in this present moment, and the past things earlier than this moment in the past, not real. Things are later than this moment in the future, not real. Okay, so only what's present is real. That's supposed to be intuitive. It's supposed to be so intuitive that, for example, there's a philosopher called Bigelow in the 90s who said that everybody thinks it, even the people who disagree with it think it's true. 
they just don't realise that they're, they haven't thought clearly enough. And um, even though Einstein, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but this is supposed to be problematic given relativistic physics. Relativistic physics takes the difference between the past, present, and the future and makes it, um, in a word, derivative. It's not a fundamental property of the world. It's certainly not something that divides up reality. You know, that that you tell the difference between the real things and the not real things. So the difference between the past, present, and future isn't a distinction between the real things and the not real things. So that's because, according to relativity, that's supposed to be what's going on. Okay, so that's supposed to be intuitive, presentism, which is the idea that only the present is real. And the alternative is eternalism, which is the view that it doesn't matter what time you pick, 10,000 years from now, a billion years ago, whatever, this moment, they're all equally as real as each other. Everything at all those different times are equally as real. In practice, the difference between them is often cashed out as, um, according to presentism, this conversation is real, future Martian colonies are not, dinosaurs are not, because dinosaurs died out. While eternalism goes, no dinosaurs, and if there are future Martian colonies, then future Martian colonies and our conversation. These are all equally as real as each other. So keep that in mind, because the next thing I want to say is, um, here's another intuition. So a lot of arguments have then said that presentism is intuitive, eternalism is counterintuitive, and it's one of the things that's so strange about relativistic physics. The past is as real as the present? How odd is that? And all that kind of stuff. While the present being the only reality is intuitive, and it's supposed to be a really compelling intuition that lots of people have, and so on. Here's another intuition. When you open your eyes and you look up at the night sky, or you look at distant shores, you look at the, the, room, the wall on the other side of the room, or you go out and you look around you, what you see is real. Okay? That's another intuition. What you see is real. And if you go outside at night and look up at the distant stars, like Proxima Centauri, to kind of be current, because, you know, it's supposed to have this Earth-like planet around it, right? So pro- the shining of light of Proxima Centauri is uh, that, the light of that that's supposed to be real. You look at that star and it's shining and it's supposed to be real. What are you saying? Now, the argument for that is actually that it seems to be real. You look at the stars, they don't seem to be unreal. They seem to be real. Okay? And that's supposed to be intuitive. So that's kind of like a motivation and it's equally intuitive and so on. But there's a problem and this problem was figured out by... Um, this comes from research, scientific research. So it's an empirical fact. It doesn't have to be true. But it just happens to be true of this our world our particular world, our, as in our universe, is that light takes time to travel. It's finite. It doesn't really matter how fast it is. The important point is that it's finite. It's not infinitely fast. It doesn't travel in an instance. Like uh, medieval scholars, like a lot of Arabian medieval scholars like Al-Kindi used to believe. It's just instant. It's not instantaneous at all. It, it takes time to get to us. Like the light from Proxima Centauri, which we actually can't see because it's a red giant. But anyway, from from that star takes four and a half years to get to us which means that the shining we're seeing is actually four and a half years in the past so we've got a choice we end up in a situation the following situation either what we're seeing being past is not real because presentism is true all right or alternatively what we're seeing being past is real because eternalism is true and it seems to us that it's real. So the second one seems to be the preferred option. But it means that our counterintuitive view of time is more compatible with our experience and with things that are seem important to us in terms of our intuition than the alleged intuition of a time. It, the, the empirical evidence that was brought out, the, the, the Romer's experiments that showed that the speed of light is finite, which he was, by the way, mocked for at the time by Cassini, for example. The, philosopher, the um, astronomer for Cassini mocked him at the time for it. But that empirical evidence doesn't play a factor in this. It plays a factor because it sets the stage. It's a premise that you should accept about the world. But it isn't actually a... This isn't a scientific question about whether or not eternalism is preferable to presentism or presentism is preferable to eternalism. The answer is based on our intuitions or what we want to hold on to. And choosing between what we want to hold on to can be a philosophical question because it isn't a question that's that's decided by doing an experiment somewhere. On its, on its own. For example, if you really think it matters that only the present is real, then you'll argue that either we're under an illusion of some kind or we're hallucinating when we look at stars in the sky because they're not really there, because you can do that with, for example, Betelgeuse. So 
I get this from Grace, Grace Weir, the artist Grace Weir, because she works with astronomers. She tells me that it's possible, and she got this from a guy in Trinity College, Dublin's an astronomer there who thinks it might actually be the case that Betelgeuse, the star Betelgeuse, might have already exploded, like exploded in the last 600 years, gone supernova. But of course, we see it 600 years ago. We see it during the reign of the Avenant Papacy. When you, look up at, when you look up at Ryan's belt, basically, you're looking at something 600 years ago. Or alternatively, you're not looking at something 600 years ago. You're looking at something that's like a surrogate from it, that's standing in for it, like, like the retinal activity in your eye or stuff going on in your brain. Or alternatively, you are seeing it, but it's not real, even though it seems to be real. And those two options I just gave you there are options because only the present is real, if you really want to hold on to that. But if you don't care about that, but you want us to see things that are real because they seem to be real, then, like I've argued, you should just give up on presentism, forget about that intuition, and turn around and go, eternalism is good. And other things at other times are just as real as things at this time. I can't remember the author either, but uh, it, I can only remember the Simpsons parody. <laughs> where Homer keeps time travelling back in the past and messing things up and starts losing his mind after a while. Is it, oh, is it Ray Bradbury? Yes. I just Googled it. The Sound yeah. of Thunder. Okay, yeah. I haven't seen it though. Yeah, it's a film as well. Yeah, it's not a very good film. Um, the Sound of Thunder is a really famous... I mean, if anyone knows anything about time travel, they don't need to hear this, but I'll repeat it just briefly. Um, it's about men who go... It's about people who go back in time travel. The time travel has been invented... But they go back in time and they turn up in the Jurassic period and they go down a single strip of land, especially artificial bridge, and they're, they're game hunters and they go and they shoot a, a Tyrannosaurus. And they're not allowed to do anything. They're not allowed to step off the path or do anything else. They must go down exactly and they have hunters who go with them who are trained professionals. And you know, it's like, it's like game hunting in Africa. So, and they kill a bull a, um, Tyrannosaurus who they know is going to die anyway, so they know everything that's going to happen that time to do with what they're going to do, so they're not changing the what actually happens at all. And one guy by accident steps off the path and steps on a butterfly, and when they get back into the present, the, the, pre, the president is completely different. This fascist president has taken over. <laughs> and, well. and the whole idea is that one small... It's a butterfly. It's also a combination of the chaos theory idea of the butterfly effect, which is the idea that one small change in the past can alter things irrevocably in the future. And I mean... I think we're all aware of that because I've got to say, I don't know about you, but I can certainly name, I don't know, if I really sat down, I could name about five or six things at least just offhand in my own life, which seem very small at the time, very incidental, which have altered and determined my life, have altered the way my path would have otherwise gone or have actually determined the way my life is now. You know, so uh, there's a butterfly effect, which is a film with Ashton Kutcher. Ashton Kutcher, yeah, and um, really odd film. When you look at the underlying, you know, like, like he goes back to him being a little kid and he remembers, he experiences that moment that he'd forgotten. He's like, he, the story starts off with him having lost time and then he goes back and picks up on the lost time because he's actually an adult during that last time. Literally the adult version of Ashton Kutcher is possessing the young version of Ashton <laughs> Kutcher and that's why the young version of Ashton Kutcher can't remember it because he's like being possessed by the older version who then knowing stuff that the old Ashton Kutcher knows does things, right? To change his life. And then, of course, like all time travel movies like this, when you sit down and you think about it, it stops making any sense because what Kutcher does is he goes back in time, changes his fate and changes everything, even though the story starts off with us knowing that he has lost time and therefore the story starts off in his unchanged life remembering gaps, uh, remembering that he had lost time, which means that he's already gone back and remembered being someone, but not changed. But, oh, I don't know, sorry. Every time I try to talk about time travel mechanics, I mean, like, Looper. Oh my God, Looper. Oh, Looper. Looper is a film. Like, why? I mean, I know this, I know everybody who's thought about this just has brought this one up, but but why did that guy as an older man who was being played by Paul Dano when he was younger. Have you seen Looper? Yeah, I have, yeah. If you work as a kind of an assassin and one of your jobs is also to kill um, future people sent back from the future. People sent back from the future, you're supposed to kill them and then you get money off them. And then when you get the gold bars, it's yourself. It's actually your future self you've got to kill. And then you could get to live off the rest of your life until it happens to you. 
And Bruce Willis plays the older version of um, the guy from Third Rock from the Sun, whose name I can never remember either. I'm really bad at names at the moment. But... Um, exactly, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Yeah, yeah. And there is this part in it where there is this guy who does a who guy from the future comes back and manages to escape and he starts running away and trying to flee and he's an old man you know he's much older like 30 or 40 years older than than the 25 year old so he's in his 60s i guess and he's running away and then they capture the younger version of him to make him to kill him basically but also to get him to come back they capture him and they they start cutting off they basically start sorry for sensitive listeners but they start cutting off limbs and there's a scene where the older guy is running through the streets and we know that they've cut off Paul Dano's feet because this guy's feet disappear and his shoes fall away. And the question is, what is the logic here? Because why was this guy wearing shoes without feet? You know, like, <laughs> like how do you, yeah. like, when you think about it, it's like, that doesn't make any sense. And um, now I, I, I like, when I'm trying to figure this stuff out, I like to play a, a kind of a game of, Let's try and make sense. So it's it's an instantaneous like event that it you know that wanting something to change and being capable of changing it automatically changes it because um, I mean it all happens at the same time because you you loop back you see what I mean like you 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 change a thing and then you um, arrive back in the new present all at the same time and all the time. Well, yeah, I mean, if you... Well, the, the really strange thing is that it, that isn't even... You completely re-change all of the previous history, right? So, like, it's like that thing of mm-hmm. Marty McFly turning up in Back to the Future. It's the same thing. Yeah. Marty McFly turns up yeah. and goes, oh, I've got... It doesn't remember. It doesn't have the memories. So the, 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 the physical being that's Marty McFly in 1985 at the end of the movie, he lives in a well, nice house... Um, has parent, parents and sisters and brothers who seem successful and happy and opens up his uh, garage and his car has been replaced by this lovely big pickup. Um, mm. And that means the history of the world between Marty's 1955 and 1985 is completely different to what Marty remembers it being. The second, mm. And the same with Terminator. Skynet's in the same situation, but the difference is Skynet stays in the future. Skynet isn't the same as Marty going back. Skynet is in the future, and Skynet basically is in a situation where Skynet is happy. You know, is not unhappy. Skynet has dominated all the human race. And as a result, Skynet doesn't send back. Now, as for the instant change, there's not even an instant change because it's not like you go back into the past and then you press a button and then it, re- it changes the button at the front. It changes all of the time in between. You, do you know what I'm saying? Because mm-hmm. there's no Sarah Connor and she doesn't yeah. have babies. She doesn't have John Connor. John Connor doesn't become a rebel. None of that happens. So mm-hmm. all that history is different. Skynet comes into existence and uh, doesn't get dominated, take, you know, defeats everybody, but then doesn't send back a Terminator because of it. Never sends back a Terminator to yeah. kill the original Sarah Connor. Which means now... You have to ask, where did the first Terminator come from? Yeah. Because there's no event in the future. It's not the same. It's not just that it's not the same future. It's not the future of the Terminator that turned up, that the Terminator of the past <laughs> came from. Yes. All right? Yeah. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So, yeah, 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 yeah. So what you then have is that if it really is the future you're changing, if you're really changing the future, then you cancel out the Terminator being sent back. The Terminator doesn't go back. Sarah Connor lives gives birth to John O'Connor. John O'Connor rebels against Skynet, defeats Skynet. Skynet these throws, sends back the Terminator. And so now wants to send back the Terminator, sends it back. Um, the Terminator goes back, kills Sarah Connor if he succeeds. John Connor isn't born. The Skynet's happy because Skynet is happy. Skynet doesn't want to send back the Terminator, doesn't send back the Terminator. I'm going to keep doing this all night. I'm going to keep saying this, <laughs> these four or five sentences over and over again. And the point about it is that mm-hmm. each one is incoherent. It's actually, it's what the philosopher David Lewis kind of pointed out. Well, David Lewis wrote about this in the 70s, but basically the idea is that it's an incoherent idea. Yeah. Here's the thing. What actually happens in Terminator isn't that. Terminator makes perfect sense as a movie because no one succeeds. You know, in fact, it's all fatalistic. Uh, John Connor, in fact, Terminator created its own destruction because it created... Um, it sent it caused sign, it, it caused Kyle Reese to go back. Kyle Reese would have never gone back unless 
the Terminator went back. And because Kyle Reese went back, then John Connor was born, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's actually a film where, yes, somebody wants to go back and change the past, but they got what they didn't want. Mm. 